Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Coffee and Football, presented by BKCW. I'm your host, Blake Monroe, where I'm joined each and every morning by C.J. Vogel, Bobby Burton, and Jerry Hamilton. Welcome back again, Jerry. I, I, guess I, got, two, like, I got two things. Go you ahead. Have your bird dog shorts on. If not, you failed this morning. And two, um, I love hearing from where everybody checks in from. I've missed that, man. Somebody said Dalton, Georgia, earlier in the chat. I might be up there next Friday. That's possible. You're you going to get some carpet. Out dinner. It's basketball there's, at Dalton High next Friday. Hey, there's some carpet in Dalton now. That's like carpet category of the world, our king of the world. <laughs> that way. Well, yeah, do, do tell us where you're checking in from. We would definitely appreciate that. But, guys, let's get started. Uh, a lot going on with recruiting. New offers, coaches on the road. I mean, what's the latest there? Yeah, Jerry, you have a piece today that I thought was outstanding. Go for it, dude. Yeah, no, number of new offers. Um, you know, uh, Blake talked to uh, Josias Sharma, uh, the defensive lineman, which I think is such an interesting offer. He's at Folsom. He played at Bobby. I'm going to mispronounce it. Endercom in Sacramento his junior season. Now up in now up in Folsom at the Northern California Power. Uh, there he was a Washington commitment. Decommitted December 27th. Obviously with that coaching change. But he's a guy, as Blake can talk about, that grew up in Arlington, has family in Austin. So this isn't just a Johnny Nansen, California West Coast recruiter for Texas up in Sacramento, Folsom just offered anybody. He offered somebody that has a connection to Texas. And oh, by the way, he'll end up a top 100 type player in the country. Uh, there is no question in my mind. He's got some of the things that I think Texas is really going to hone in on uh, in recruiting in this class specifically. He's got SEC size. But with that, he's got quickness and power. And I'm and I'm going to say something here, too. He has no idea how good he can be. His ass is in a, even above his shoulders in his stance. Once he gets his butt above his shoulders and can really fire off the football, watch out. And then they offered Cortland Guillory. Texas offered a, a Klein Oak corner, uh, a, a guy that uh, I was – a couple of college coaches told me about in December – I'm a big fan of this kid. He can play corner. He can play nickel. He's got some natural strength in good basketball player. Texas offered yesterday at a Klein Oak, Cortland Guillory. He was at Tennessee on the 20th for a junior day, got offered. Texas A&M just offered him this morning after meeting with him. So his recruitment's starting to pick up to where it should be. And I'm sure, I'm sure CJ's got a lot more on what uh, uh, the uh, new defensive line coaches are doing on the road yesterday. Yeah, up to seven prospects. Kenny Baker has seen over the last three days, all of which very high, highly touted guys on the in-state side of things. Yesterday, he was in the DFW area, stopped by Xavier Upono yesterday, uh, and has plenty of stops today. Uh, actually, one more offer I wanted to mention. Texas extended an offer to a 2026 quarterback right now who we're monitoring right now, Keyshawn Henderson, out of the legacy, the School of uh, Sports Sciences in Houston. Texas is very picky. Sarkeesian and Milby specifically at the quarterback position. We'll see where he develops. There's a lot of talk about his overall athleticism and what he brings to the table with this ball with the ball in his hand. So that's something to watch as well. And, Jerry, I know you're very high on Jonathan Cunningham, the, the linebacker, 25 yeah. linebacker out of North Crowley. He's also teammates with John Turntine, who we both believe uh, is in the conversation for being the best overall prospect in the state of Texas. Texas is doing a great job of extending offers early on right now, and their evaluations right now, five very strong offers extended yesterday. And with these coaches on the road again today, it's looking like you can see a few more extended out Friday afternoon. Yeah, I'll hit on, I'll hit on Jonathan Cunningham real quick, Bobby. Uh, six, two and a half, 190 pound linebacker at North Crowley. Long arms. His frame is going to take off in the next couple of years. I talked to the head coach, Ray Gates, at North Crowley about him uh, in December. Uh, very, He was very high on his upside. And I think at the time he had maybe four or five offers. Obviously, one of those early offers for Jonathan Cunningham was Utah. Anytime Utah offers a defensive player early in Texas, all of us in this business better take a look at that film pretty quick. Yeah. Uh, TCU offered, Arkansas offered, Oklahoma State's offered the really good evaluators, Oklahoma State being one of those. They offered him early. Uh, but I love the offer by Texas to Jonathan Cunningham at North Crowley. Coach Nansen was by last week. Then yesterday, Sark and Choice, when they were making some rounds in DFW, stopped by North Crowley also to show some face to turn time, uh, but offered uh, Cunningham. And I think that's a tremendous offer. There's a lot of depth at linebacker in Texas. In 2025, we don't get to say that very often, so I'm going to say it a lot in this cycle. A lot of quality depth at linebacker in the state. I love that offer. And on John Turntine, 
Um, I haven't had a chance to talk about him as much as I want. I'm probably jinxing the heck out of the kid, but I thought he was the best, highest upside prospect in the state, period. 24, 25, 26 class last year. And now he's got to go do it. He's got to maximize his talent. But he is an elite, elite left tackle prospect. Hey, hey uh, y'all said five. Uh, just to re reiterate here, CJ, you said five total. I've got Sharma, jo Josiah Sharma out of Folsom, California is one of them. He's the one with the Texas tie uh, through uh, Arlington and Austin. Cortland Guillory, the corner out of uh, Klein Oak. Kaysan Henderson, a 2026 quarterback athlete. We need to figure out whether or not he's being recruited as a quarterback or athlete out of the Houston area. A Jonathan Cumming Cunningham out of North Crowley. And who was the other one? Oh, uh, the 26 cornerback Waters out of uh, Sefner, Florida. Yeah, oh, Tampa Armwood, right? And okay. that makes sense because Jeff Banks has been down in that Tampa area. He offered Myron Charles, the four-star defensive lineman at Port Charlotte on the 31st. Uh, I'm, I'm quite sure he went by Zephyr Hills to see DJ Pickett, the five-star safety. Blake Gideon had gone by there late in the season as well. I don't think I don't think Texas is getting anywhere on that one right now. But they're you know look they're gonna they're gonna recruit through the whistle as we like that we as we coined it here a couple of years ago. Uh, but yeah, that was the, I like the offers. There's a Texas connection within the recruiting department to Tampa seven on seven football. So I like the more Texas recruits Orlando, Tampa, and the Tampa area, the happier I'm going to be on this show. I'll tell you that. <laughs> hey, Jerry, the other thing four trips for me. Let's I, be I real. Think CJ reported on this for us. Michael Fasusi, uh, the big offensive lineman, uh, he got a visit from Sark early yesterday morning along with Kyle Flood. I think it's a shard choice. Was even there? Um, is it? Is that? That's the big lineman, offensive lineman that may be the top one on the board from the state of Texas. Is is that going to be a Texas OU battle, CJ? What's what's that situation, bud? Well, Texas is certainly making up for what you might consider lost ground in the early bit of January in which he was unable to make it down to Austin. Uh, doesn't mean Texas is behind in their recruitment with them, obviously. Uh, Fasusi was very high on Texas early on. Uh, before the season, making it to campus uh, during the, the July uh, junior day as well. So Oklahoma is a team to watch out for, as well as A&M in my eyes. Uh, you know, this kind of regional battle for Fasusi, Oklahoma feels really positive about their ability uh, and history from uh, Coach Biedenbaugh up there, the offensive line coach for the Sooners, to develop big, big bodied offensive linemen as the pitch from that side of things going to Fasusi. But like you mentioned, I actually really enjoy seeing Tashard Choice join in on these, these uh, in-person visits with recruits right now, not necessarily specifically running back guys. You know, you see him joining in uh, on the, the commitment visits with uh, Emory Winston and Brandon Brown on the out-of-state side of things, getting him out there and involved in these recruitments, a high-energy guy that is relatable and has good personality helps Texas's chances in all of these recruitments right now. Getting him back on campus to see Fasusi yesterday was big in my eyes, just to kind of, you know, feel that familiarity again with the Texas staff. No, uh, we, we want to know, we know about the blue chips whenever we hear about them. Go yeah. ahead, Jerry. Uh, we, we, uh, CJ and I kind of talked about it on the special edition of recruiting breakdown yesterday, but um, it's it's already lining up that, that last weekend in June, I believe it's 27th through 29th this year, Marcus Harris, the receiver from Modern Day, is already out there and said he, he, he'll he likely visit that weekend. I think Vasusi is getting locked in for that weekend. I don't know when he'll announce it. I think Tyler Thomas, the offensive lineman at Dickinson, is getting close to getting that date locked in, or that's being talked about. So Texas going around seeing these top targets, that date is being talked about because Texas wants to, again, get that last visit in June, that last visit weekend, a lot of their – key targets. So the other thing with that uh, meeting with Fasusi yesterday that uh, Blake, uh, sorry, that CJ and I talked about was that uh, Fasusi's dad uh, was at Louisville for that and at Louisville High. And he hasn't been at all of them. Not all the family members have been at all the meetings. Uh, so I think that was a good sign for Texas as well. Yeah, Blake, if I if I can chime in one last thing, that last visit weekend in, all, in, uh, in June, that official visit weekend that we keep mentioning, I have a list real quick from last year just to give you an idea of how impressive it was and how important Texas is viewing that weekend before going into the, the, the closed window. Trey Owens, Jarrett Gibson, Parker Livingstone, Micah Hudson, Daniel Cruz, Nate Kibble, Colin Simmons, Zena, Umi Ozulu, Dominic McKinley, Jaden Jackson, Ty Anthony Smith, Kobe Black, Jordan Johnson Rubel, Terry Bussey, Corian Gibson. They're trying to load up that last week. And that there's probably about 10 more names on that list. But you get an idea of just how important they're viewing it, and they're going to try and do it again this year 
already a, a pretty solid start in my eyes. Hey, I got to ask CJ real quick. Is that a 2018 or 97 Sugar Bowl shirt? <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't tell. Uh, 95. No, 95. Sorry. Wow. Penn State. It's a Was classic. Penn State of Virginia Tech? I can't remember. Yeah, he went Arch Manning and like went to a Austin. in Austin and found the, the oldest shirt he could find from a Texas Bowl game. <laughs> I can't turn around. There's so many holes in the back that this is just my front viewing shirt. <laughs> I was going to say, is Nokia even a thing anymore? <laughs> I haven't That's a seen great that. question. That's a good question. <laughs> hey, guys, before we move on to the next thing, uh, Jonathan Rodriguez wants to know about the, the Gilroy kid, the Gilroy kid oh. in Houston. Is there any relation to Racine in Alito? I don't think so, but let me ask. I'll get that by the end of the show. Okay. There you go. All right. Well, Bobby, you wrote an interesting piece over on ontexasfootball.com this morning about the personnel changes going on at Texas. Can you give folks the latest on that? Yeah, absolutely. So yesterday, right after we went off air, it was announced that Billy Guillory, uh, Billy, Billy Guillory, I have, <laughs> have Guillory on my name, uh, Billy Glasscock, uh, the former uh, director of player personnel at Texas, was leaving Texas to take the uh, general manager's job at Ole Miss for Lane Kiffin. Now, there's a couple of things that are going on here. Behind the scenes, Steve Sarkeesian was already in the process of restructuring his off-field group of uh, analysts, uh, personnel department, supports personnel, all of it. And he was likely going to go to a GM model. Uh, now, not necessarily being labeled a GM, though, is the important part. So what happens here, Glasscock leaves for getting that title and a, a raise, et cetera, all that other stuff. So now there's a question, how, does Sark continue on with this process or does he backfill the roles and wait another another year before figuring things out and how he wants to do it long-term? I don't know yet. And I don't know if he's decided yet because uh, Glasscock decided earlier this week to take that job. Uh, I don't know. Uh, is the answer. I do know one, a couple of things though. I expect two people that have been key and integral to the back end of the Texas coaching staff off field to continue to be part of the staff and to get bumps in either title raises, et cetera. They are Brandon Harris, who is, uh, if you haven't followed his career, played at LSU, was out of Shreveport, uh, came to Texas with Sark, uh, or actually was at, at Texas before Sark, but stayed with Sark and has been there. And he seems to be in Sark's circle of trust, uh, for lack of a better term. And the reason I say that is because when uh, Bo Davis got put uh, got left for LSU, Sark put Brandon Harris on the road uh, to recruit for the University of Texas. I'm seeing Brandon Harris likely being elevated in some capacity right now. That's what I'm hearing behind the scenes. Furthermore, the other the other person to, to look out for is John Michael Jones. Uh, he's been a longtime Texas uh, staffer, uh, went to the University of Texas, graduated there. He was the assistant director of player personnel a year ago. I'm hearing that he's also going to get some sort of uh, increase, uh, bump, et cetera. Those two guys, Brandon Harris and John Michael Jones, I think will be uh, two of the key players in Sark's off-field operations. Very interesting. And for more on that, you can go to ontexfootball.com. And like I said, Bobby wrote a uh, pretty good piece there that explains that more in depth. So be sure to check that out. And before we move on, guys, Bobby, I'm going to let you tell everybody about BKCW and how folks can escape the insurance trap. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, did your business have a frustrating insurance or employee benefits renewal? Most likely you didn't hear from your agent all year. And then right before it was time to renew, they delivered the bad news of a rate increase. When this happens, the agent is providing no value and you're stuck in what we call the insurance trap. BKCW takes you out of the insurance trap by providing your business with actual risk management consulting, not just price quoting. Operating, operating out of its headquarters in Austin and owned by UT Grad, BKCW uses a five-step process to identify your business's weak spots, design a plan, execute it, and monitor your situation throughout the year so that you can lower your insurance costs and effectively manage your company's risk. BKCW has already helped some of the most well-known construction companies, restaurant groups, breweries, nonprofits, on Texas football, in all of them in Central Texas, escape the insurance trap. And it all starts with a free risk assessment. Go to bkcw.com or send them an email, info 
at bkcw.com to get started with a free risk assessment and escape the insurance trap. Thanks, BKCW. Okay, guys. Well, last night the Shrine Bowl happened. Of course, we have the Senior Bowl coming up this weekend and uh, lots of draft stock improving for a number of Longhorns, it seems like. For example, CBS Sports released their latest mock draft yesterday. They had Byron Murphy going number five overall to the Chargers. Uh, first, let, let's start with this Shrine Bowl. CJ, I, I know you watched it. We saw Ryan Watts in action a little bit. What did you think? I, I liked what I saw, and I thought coming into the week, it was a great opportunity for Ryan Watts to compete against the best in the country that also have, you know, draft aspirations. Watts, the biggest question mark was where NFL teams view him. Coming into the week, there was times at which they used him at safety. That was where he initially thought he was going to be playing in the NFL. That's where he wanted to enter the week of C, uh, of the Shrine Bowl for practices uh, this, this past week. He actually got a lot of run at cornerback as well last night uh, during the, the live action. Not a whole lot of snaps for Ryan Watts. He made a couple tackles. He was uh, he was pretty active in the run support as well. So uh, I, I'm eager to see just where he translates to to the next level. I think we all kind of have that that idea. If he did return to Texas, there would be a, a possible movement back deep to safety. Seeing that as you know, kind of where the NFL suits him as well right now, it makes sense. Uh, one of the biggest positives, Blake, was obviously his speed that was that was cli- uh, that was clocked in earlier in the week. He was one of the fastest players in the entire uh, week of practice. So certainly something that I think he's starting to answer some of the questions about his game on the field, something encouraging to to really raise his draft stock because that's a big question mark at the moment. And to your point about uh, Byron Murphy in which going number five in that recent uh, mock draft, we know Jim Harbaugh loves his trenches to be stockpiled. That's, <laughs> that's a, that's an interesting point right there. <laughs> number five is the highest I've seen from, the, from any Longhorn in a while. Yeah, he wants he wants guys that can't fit in his tiny house next to the <laughs> his RV. He's gonna live in an RV. He said, That's crazy. right outside the stadium. Yeah, right outside. Hey, I I said I wrote this on the message board yesterday afternoon when I read that that he's gonna live in an RV next to the stadium. He said he's gonna Jim Rockford it. So I'm I'm just gonna ask anybody on any of the three of you guys. Now I'm 54. I'm the oldest one here. Have y'all even heard of Jim Rockford before, Blake, Jerry, or CJ? Not once. Nope. Nah, if he's not on Bravo, I don't know him. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is a this is Jim Garner back. I think that's who played it back in the like early seventies. It's a re- TV show reference to a, a a detective that lived out of a RV. I mean, I, I mean, I, I, I got a prediction. Harbaugh reaches back to get his. His uh, metaphors, I guess. If he's living in an RV, his wife will be living in Newport Beach, okay? <laughs> she ain't living at the RV. <laughs> she wants running water, man. <laughs> hey, is that the Rockford Files? Is that the same thing? Yes! Oh, okay. When you I, when you said detective, and then it, and it started clicking. So, yes, I, I've never seen it, but I have heard of it. <laughs> okay yeah i mean the the people that are my age and older are going to be going nodding if they've heard this the young guys are going to say what in the hell reference was that yeah never seen it though for sure well one thing during the shrine bowl last night fellas is sark got a lot of screen time they interviewed him in depth for 10 maybe 15 minutes maybe even 20 uh but in champ bailey three actually brings it up he, Sark mentioned we might have 10 to 12 guys drafted. Do you think that's coach speak, or do you feel like Texas has a legit spot, uh, shot to get 10-plus guys drafted? You, you know why I think they do? Because one of the things that I think we were talking about it that uh, Nagy said in a senior bowl interview is that with so, some guys coming back to college unexpected – those late rounds are going to be really interesting for the draft, round six, seven, five, six, seven. So does Keelan Robinson. I mean, do those guys that are the, the really good special teams players then end up getting drafted? I think there's a better chance. Uh, could Texas have 10 to 12? I mean, I think we can go down the list, but yes. And by the way, I still think it's amazing that Byron Murphy's being mentioned. Um, and I actually put a text out to somebody who uh, – what will know the answer to this, how legitimate they think that is, him climbing into the top 10. Uh, I'll let you know if we get an answer that before the end of the show. But I think we can go down the list, but I think it's entirely possible 10 guys get drafted. Well, I, I, I look, I've got eight that are going to go for sure. Okay. These are guys that I would bet every single one of them go at some point. And CJ's a, 
CJ's kind of our rough resident draft guru. He loves the draft. But the ones that are for sure going to go, uh, Byron Murphy to Vondre Sweat, that's two. At receiver, Adonai Mitchell and Xavier Worthy are definitely going to go, right? So that's four. Then you have Jonathan Brooks, that's yep. five. Jalen Ford is six. Christian Jones is seven. And JT Sanders is eight. Now you can say which in which order and all that and stuff, yeah. but those are eight guys that are going to get drafted. Now, who are the guys that might get drafted? You mentioned Keelan Robinson. I, I mean, I see that as a very remote possibility. Jordan Whittington, I see as a likelihood, but maybe 50-50. You just don't know. And him not participating in the senior bowl didn't help his odds, probably. Uh, but he's he's gonna have to go and, and do do something at the pro day. And then Ryan Watts, right? So, you know, is Ryan Sanborn a pro prospect at punter? I don't know. I mean, what do y'all, what do you, I think there's eight for sure. Yeah. Eight to 12 yeah. would be heavy. Yeah. Yeah. I think eight, I, I'm with you. I think eight for sure, 10 possible. I don't see 12. 12 would mean Sanborn gets drafted. Yep. Yeah. I'm with you there. Watts certainly helped us stock this week. I don't think Jordan Whittington did a lot, obviously, not participating. That's something that a lot of scouts were looking forward to seeing how he tested up against, you know, the, the best coverage guys in the country looking to go to the NFL. Also getting some times and measurables on him. I know that there might have been a late ding up that he suffered late in the season. That was the reason why we didn't see Byron Murphy on the field this week. Uh, but like you said, he's going to have to put on a good time during the, the, the pro day because those times going into the combine are really going to be what scouts have the last kind of say on in which they'll spend a, a late round draft pick on them. I, I want to say this about Byron Murphy, which, but, and this is like the biggest compliment I can give the guy is it's amazing that he's being talked about as a top 10 draft pick because let's just go down the NFL list. He's not as tall as they want. He doesn't have the arm length they want, and he's not as – twitched up as an Aaron Donald is so when you look at an, un, an and no nobody is you know what I'm saying I mean to be a top 10 type level guy it you know what that means when they talk to Sark when they call Bo Davis when they talk to anybody around that kid Claude Mathis at DeSoto when I was through there during the season the the, the NFL scouts had been calling on him and Shamar Turner at AM. that means he's getting great reviews by anybody the NFL talks about, that's that's helping his rise up the draft boards. Uh, is the NFL's learning that this guy, you know, I, I last year somebody told me you don't know, with Byron Murphy at Texas. <laughs> I mean, that's what pe that's what people said, and so he is rising up the boards as much for the type of guy he is, the work ethic, the drive, all the characteristics outside of what you see on the football field, because he's overcoming the lack of length, the lack of height, and not as much twitch as an Aaron Donald. Jerry, can I ask you, going back to his recruitment, obviously Shamar Turner was on that same defensive line there. You can look at the stars, the ratings. It felt like, you know, I, I think consensusly, Shamar Turner was the higher rated of the two yeah. uh, in the final rankings. What is, do you remember how that kind of played out? Because at times, you know, AM landed the bigger fish, yeah. quote unquote, and Byron Murphy was seen as, in a way, a consolation. But what, what do you remember in the sense of seeing both of them on the same line together and you know, how they kind of projected at the time? And obviously, you know, how, what he's doing now is pretty impressive. Yeah. Byron was a low, like one of the lowest rated four star guys as it ended. But I'll tell you what was impressive is if you were to DeSoto practice and they went back to back in drills, man. I mean, just, you know, Byron was one of those guys that, again, you know, at the time, six foot and a quarter, six foot and a half. I don't know what they'll actually measure at 275. Right. You know, who you know who saw him. Everybody's Texas, one of Texas fans favorites, Joey McGuire. Really got him committed to Baylor early. Right. Um, they were on him early. Joey identified him early. Obviously, he should. He was a coach at Cedar Hill for years. Right. I mean, he knew he, he knew a lot of these kids when they were coming up. Uh, but he identified that athleticism early. And I don't want to make it sound like he's not athletic. He's just not as twitchy as Aaron Donald. Byron Murphy's a former high, a running back until he grew out of the position. Uh, but I think late, I think he developed later, even get adding that weight. So his senior year, he looked the different to college coaches than his junior year on tape. But Shamar Turner, I mean, look, Shamar should be a first round pick. If he's not, it's on him. I'll say that. From a talent perspective, that dude's extremely talented.
Hey, Good DJ, deal. I know you've been watching the senior bowl practices quite a bit, and you and I have both have posted a lot of clips uh, from those practices, you know, like on Twitter and on TexasFootball.com. But the, what about Christian Jones, man? I mean, it seems like, you know, you talk to anybody or you hear anybody comment on him, and he's only helped himself this week, it sounds like. Yeah, it definitely has. And excuse me, I got the, the trash truck outside me, so if you all hear anything <laughs> in the background, that's – the Friday morning buzz I get over here, but Christian Jones has certainly helped his uh, his draft stock 100%. Day one, I thought he had one of the best performances of any offensive line lineman at this uh, uh, Reese's Senior Bowl. He was, in, he was he won basically every pass rep he had in the one on ones. I know that's not the tell all, but when you're going against guys that are hoping you be, be drafted in those you know day, day two picks, that certainly is going to help your stock. He's also getting work at right guard as well. I think a lot of teams are viewing him as a guy that they can move into the interior as well. Uh, at great measurables, 318, 6'5", and uh, just a hair of a, a wingspan under seven feet long. So really, really impressive stuff from the measurable side of things. And then the film is starting to back it up as well. Took a step back day two and then put together another really strong day of film on day three. Uh, at, uh, for, a, for a camp and a set of practices where we were expecting to see a little bit more Longhorn helmets running around, it's really nice to see Christian Jones stepping up and competing against really some of the top guys in the in, in the draft this upcoming year. Uh, he's, he's made himself a lot of money. You know, we talk about him kind of being that fringe sixth, seventh round guy. I think you now kind of pencil him into a guy that's going to hear his name called for sure. The other thing, I, I just got a text back from somebody. They think Murphy ultimately goes 12 to 25 in the first round unless he really tests off the charts. Got it. Hey, on Christian Jones, Jerry and, and CJ, one thing I wanted to add, I talked to a, a scout, I guess it was on Tuesday night. Uh, he said that they went in there. He does not scout Texas. So I want to, I want to, you know, categorize that first. He does not scout the university of Texas. Typically he saw him play a year ago. He was, cro they, they cross check at the senior bowl. All those guys go down there and watch everybody else. Right. And what, it, what they had said was they felt like their, their original guy that does do Texas had said that Christian Jones, uh, they were looking at more as a guard. And the question they had going into this week, like they had circled and everybody said, can this guy do this? I mean, they do it across the board, right? They want to know if Christian Jones could start for them at guard. And after one practice, I talked to that, that scout uh, slash executive. He told me that Christian Jones could start for them at guard. So he may not be a tackle, but he's going to, if, if they think he can start in the NFL, He's not going to go in the seventh round, guys. Right. I just say this same person just pre uh, predicted sweat in the uh, very late second, probably third round. Interesting. No, he's he's overweight. He, he, yeah, he's he is. Overweight. That's what he just said. Hey, uh, I do. I want to go back to one other thing that we were talking about here. Interesting. We mentioned those eight players: Murphy, Sweat, Mitchell, Worthy, Brooks, Ford, Jones, and Sanders as the eight guys that we think are almost for sure going to be picked in the NFL draft, okay? Interestingly, three of them were committed elsewhere. Murphy was at Baylor. Worthy was at Michigan. Jalen Ford, Utah. Add in Adonai Mitchell, who originally signed with uh, Georgia. That's good recruiting, yeah. by the way. That's, that's not – you talk about recruiting through the whistle. That stuff matters. And three of those, all three of those are Murphy and Ford – were absolutely done by Tom Herman's group, right? Um, and so I'm saying all of that just to just to kind of put it out there that uh, these late commitments, the ones that come in late, sometimes are really, really impactful. Yep. Last time Texas had eight picks in the draft was 1991, in which oh. there were 12 rounds at least in the draft. So yeah, two guys this will be rounds. the record for a seven-round draft, for sure. Well, y'all are y'all are scaring me because I graduated from Texas in 1992, so I remember that draft very fondly. <laughs> you weren't one of the ones drafted. No, I was not. <laughs> they, they had the the two stands go first uh, first round, Bobby. You remember which teams? I'm sure you do. Uh, Stan Thomas either went to the Bears or Charger. No, Stanley Richard went to the Chargers. Stan Thomas went to the Bears. Yep. There we go. Winner, winner. Man. Uh, don't worry, dude. That that's the Cash Brothers were part of that. Uh, Johnny Walker, Chris Samuels. Hey, hey, I got one for you. Uh, Patton and Jeter were in that draft. While we're on draft, will Texas have more drafted next year? I think they might. That's a crazy question. But it's fun. It, like 
Absolutely. I mean, it's go I, ahead, Bobby. Looking, so I, I, one of the things we're going to do for uh, on Texas football guys is, is have what I call static web pages so that you can look and refer to them for like the roster, the schedule. But I'm going to do some interesting. I'm going to try to take it a little bit further and do depth chart, et cetera. One of the other ones I want to do is what I would call a roster breakdown that shows you, you know, the seniors, the juniors, the sophomores, and the freshmen at each position. I don't think there's going to be as many next year. Uh, that, that's my take on it, just from what I've seen. It would take somebody like Cam Williams just playing one year and going pro. You, you know what I mean by that? So, yep. And someone like Terrence Brooks going pro. Right. So that's I, I, I agree with y'all that there's a lot there. But it would require a couple of uh, a couple of guys to really come on a little bit. I do think there's going to be five or six, though. Hey, we're going to take a couple of quick draft questions. Uh, this first one from Cody Pack. He says, "What's the big difference between Jordan Davis and Tavondre Swift this year? Why did Davis get drafted in the first round? A little bit more active in the pass game. Yeah, a little bit more active, and I think his weight was a little bit." distributed a little bit better than what we're seeing from sweat right now. Sweat widens out a little bit more than what you see from Davis in his build. Uh, and so that's kind of the bigger thing there. And plus I think the Eagles just have an affinity for taking Georgia guys. In the, in the first. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a ton of them. I, they haven't gone wrong yet. Have they? <laughs> I mean, seriously, if they go, once they go wrong, they may change, but until then, right. <laughs> And then one other one, this one from Champ Bailey 3, is Brooks really going to be the number one running back in the draft off of his injury? I'm sure that injury will make him fall. I just hope he falls to my Cowboys. That'd be nice, that second round pick. I know I know the Cowboys aren't probably weren't thrilled with what Tony Pollard put on film after franchising him. Uh, also, it certainly helps Jonathan Brooks, even despite the ACL injury. It's not a deep running back class, and so... Uh, to still be in consideration for that number, that RB1 spot, even after an injury like that. I mean, that's a testament to Jonathan Brooks, obviously. I'd, I'd love to see him in, with the star in his helmet. I personally would. Selfishly, I absolutely would love to see that. Uh, on the jo on the Jordan Davis subject, uh, I just looked it up. 6'6", 341, ran 478 in lightning, 5'10", uh, uh, 5 shuttle in Elko. I mean, he lit it up at 6'6", 341, 10 and a half inch hands, all of it. Uh, the person I've been talking to sees Sweat more as a first, second down player to CJ's point in the NFL. And without that pass rush ability, that's what could knock him down the third round. Well, we have some super chats that we need to get to, so we're going to jump over to those. This first one from Sonny V. Thank you, Sonny. And he says, Jerry's back from joyriding in the Sark Chopper with Coach and Robert Duvall wreaking havoc on the recruiting missions. <laughs> Replenishing your jerky fun. Thank you. I-10 appreciates that. Bucky's, <laughs> Bucky's, Bucky's in Alabama appreciates that. <laughs> and then this next super chat here from Chris Connor. He says, hook them, boys. With Jerry back, I may just celebrate by ordering that lawnmower 5.0. Mardi Gras season is almost here, fellas. Uh, I can't pronounce that, and I'm not going to say that on the air. <laughs> that, that on Texas football promo code still work. Look, yes. look, we don't have a read, but it's just not fair. Your South Pole will shine like never before. Oh, no. Come on. <laughs> I've got I've got to wear my shirt one day. I got a manscaped shirt. I'm gonna pull up with it one day. <laughs> But Bobby's ready for me to move on, so I'm going to. <laughs> All right. Well, let's uh, let's do some recruiting questions because we have a lot of those, and obviously we touched on recruiting to open the show. E. Kim says, welcome back, Jerry, and good morning from Rockford, Illinois. Over, under, three and a half commits from Houston in the 2025 class. Uh, Sark, they definitely want that. Uh, what, what'll be interesting, uh, Bobby said, uh, I think Blake Gideon's going by to see Jonah Williams at Galveston Ball uh, today. Sark was there with Gideon last week. Um, they are now shifted recruiting to safety with Jonah Williams, which gives them a chance before. Mm, not so much at linebacker. He just doesn't see himself as a linebacker right now. Um, you know, the interesting thing will be there's a Kobe Sellers at Shadow Creek end up at Oklahoma where the lean has been during the season. Uh, does Texas go on? Do they pull? Do they go all in on Kelshawn Johnson from Hitchcock? I would, and if they do, they'll get him. Um, I mean, I think he's got electric speed, and and, and I'm, what I'm telling you, he he's not even flexible yet. He has no idea he can run ten three one day. Uh, the kid at Hitchcock, Kelshawn Johnson, 
Um, but I, I think, uh, you know, Dorian Brewer, Conroe, or what do you consider Houston area? I mean, Conroe is 82 miles north of Friendswood, where I'm at. But, you know, it's pretty much Houston area if you're talking to college coaches. Uh, but I, there's a lot of talent in the Houston area this year. Um, I'll go over on the three and a half. They, there's, it's a good year in Houston. Yeah. To your point. And, and yeah. I mean, we've talked about that before. Like it goes in waves. Yeah. Um, Dallas, the Metroplex is, is kind of, it, they just have so many people. They're always having guys. Houston has been one of those wavy cities a little bit. Yeah. Uh, and now they always have players. Don't get me wrong. But I'm talking about elite, elite guys. You know what was interesting, Bobby, that point, it, talking to some high school coaches in December, they all th- – three of the guys at really good schools, after watching the state championship, said, where are our big guys? Dallas has larger humans right now. That's just a reality. Houston maybe not, doesn't have that size up front on the offensive lines. Like North Shore teams aren't nearly as talented as they used to be. They just got a hell of a coaching staff and great culture. But, but they're not nearly as talented up front, as big a guys and as athletic a guys as they used to be. Remember some of those teams, Trey Hopkins, Cedric Flowers, multiple Division I guys with big bodies on the offensive line. They don't really have that right now. The defensive line has it this year. They haven't. Not, you mentioned the guy that we need to mention, Chase Sims, yeah. out of uh, Randall High School out in Rosenberg, wherever you want to call that area nowadays. He's, he's out there. Then you also have the Gidry. Uh, Floyd Gidry at spring. They've got some big interior linemen this year in Houston. But your point, and my point too, Jerry, to you, is it's coming in waves. Right. That's the issue. And so uh, Houston and Dallas, obviously the two largest producers of talent in the state, but it hasn't been as consistent in Houston of late. We'll see. This year, I think, is a good year on the line. Uh, in, in Texas, because t- don't forget two offensive linemen at Bridgeland too. Big time. I, I, I love those guys. Now I'm telling you, uh, Bob, Bobby, you probably covered Lonnie Madison. For yes, Park. I did. Yeah. Matthew Woodland's played at A&M, the head coach at Bridgeland. Great guy. Uh, does a good job over there. I'm telling you, I went to Bridgeland. Um, I can't remember when, man, the days get lost at this point. But uh, Ryan Foji is a way underrated guy that I think will end up being a top 150 kid in the country. And Jonte Newman on the other side. Those you don't you could go to modern day and maybe not see two better looking offensive tackles on a high school team than that. I mean, maybe Duncanville the year they had Cam and, and Bird, you know, when Cam was a junior and Bird was a senior. But I'm telling you, Foji's such an interesting prospect. I know we'll get into all these guys. Texas offered him at January 20 junior day. I think Kyle Flood was either by there today or is going tomorrow, uh, based on talking to somebody at Bridgeland. But he was a 6'4, 225, 230 pound defensive end on JV as a sophomore. He is now 6'5", 280, with a strong natural build, um, has basketball feet, can really bend, uh, but he's becoming the national recruit he should be. Jonte Newman is interesting. He's originally from Lexington, Mississippi, uh, moved here uh, his freshman year. Uh, it, he, he said his, his dad wanted to be in a better area for football, which is interesting. Fans here, Texas fans, know Lexington, Holmes County, because Terrence Hibbler was a guy Texas went after last year, D. Lyman that signed with Mississippi State. That's where Jonte Newman would have gone to high school if he stayed in Mississippi. But Bridgeland has two offensive tackles. Newman could play guard or tackle at the next level. Texas loves both of those guys, as does AM and everybody else. Yeah, it, I would go over for e, the final answer for E. Kim. If Texas has its druthers, Texas is plus three and a half commitments from Houston this year. Yes. If, no and if you consider the whole metro area, I def, I mean, I'm from Houston. Conroe is Houston, just like Hitchcock is Houston. Texas City, all that area down in there, too. So, yeah, absolutely. Home Plus, of Roy Oswald. That's great, by the way, David Rolls. That's awesome. <laughs> what did you say? Home of Roy Oswald in Mississippi. That was that's, oh, really? that, that's good trivia right there. Good the, job. The baseball pitcher, the Astros? Yep. He, was, he, still, he lives on his ranch in Mississippi. Wow. Uh, Antoine wants to know what you guys think the defensive tackle class is going to look like in 2025. And I want to piggyback off another question because somebody asked about the, 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 the most important recruits in 2025 for Texas. I'm going to ask, answer that first, and that goes right into Brandon Brown. To me, it's K.J. Lacey and Brandon Brown. It's the quarterback at Sarah Land. It's Brandon Brown, who I think is just going to be as good as any defensive tackle in, in the country in this class. Uh, I think people are finding out now he's a little taller than what he was listed at. He's not – 
six foot. I think he's closer to six one and a half, six two. Uh, but he is so explosive. Keeping those guys in the fold, I think, is huge because look, you're moving that SEC. KJ Lacey's the guy, the guy Sarkeesian targeted at quarterback in 2025. You don't want to lose that guy to Auburn or something. I think Texas, they had a great meeting with him Tuesday. I think things are moving in the right direction there. It's a long way to go. But then Brandon Brown leads into that. I just think he's such a high-end prospect. I went to O'Galley earlier in the season and saw him. I just I couldn't be more impressed with a guy. And if you haven't watched this film, go to his huddle, but don't have your children around to watch it. That's all. Because no. no. they won't play football after that. No. Uh, but D-line, D-line, there's really good prospects in state. I think Zion Williams is at the top of that board. I think Dylan Battle is right there. Both really good over the ball players. Um, but then, you know, you look at the offers. I think I think you could see if you take four, Landon Rinks right there as a legacy, good, great motor player, right? I think if you take four, you're more than likely to see two in-state, two out-of-state. I don't see a scenario where it's all four guys from in-state, right? Even if Brandon Brown went elsewhere, which I think he's solid to Texas right now. I think you're going to see that out-of-state mix. The offer out in California is very interesting to me because Blake reported on his Texas ties earlier. Then we're going to go over to the ontexasfootball.com forums, and we have a question uh, from K. John. And he said, and you talked about KJ Lacey, but he wants to know, could you describe some of the attributes KJ Lacey has that makes him a fit at quarterback for the Longhorns? Yeah, so I've seen him twice. Actually, was it three times? I don't know um, at this point. Um, I'll tell you what I love about KJ Lacey. He's got gamesmanship to him. He's got a little bit more than even what you see on tape. I like that he's got basketball feet. He was a point guard. He just gave up basketball this year. He's got that point guard mind. He plays that position both in football and basketball, the quarterback of both when he did play. I also like him because he had 75 shoe boxes on when he was on on, te- on Texas football for the interview. That was He was a very entertaining kid. we got to get him back on here. But he can make every throw, which Sark always says that, quarterbacks that can make every throw. He said, uh, said the same thing about Quinn, Malik, Trey, uh, K.J. Lacey, of course, Arch. Um, he can make every throw. But I think he layers the football. I think he's got a lot of different ball speeds about him. I think he understands feel. And I think it's that point guard background. Everything's not a fastball. Um, So he understands ball placement, timing, uh, velocity. Uh, But then he's got really good movement skills. And, And people compare him to Bryce Young, and it's natural comparison because Bryce was at Alabama. But he has that frame, and he kind of has that escapability. He's not necessarily a guy that's going to tuck it and run it. He wants to stay in the pocket and make plays with his arm. I think he fits the scheme about perfectly. Yeah, I was going to mention that exact thing. You know, he has that great feel. He's a great distributor of the football, which is exactly what Sarkeesian's looking for. You look at where he's gone with previous quarterback recruitments. Obviously, it's guys that can get the ball out and get it in an area for a wide receiver to make the play. That's K.J. Lacey. Uh, funny story, he actually told me his his reason for, for you know no longer playing basketball anymore is, one, focusing on football, clearly. But, two, he had a little run-in in the paint with uh, former Duke quarterback Riley Leonard. And I think the 6'6", uh, Riley Leonard kind of got the best of him. So I told him, you know, guys like us, you know, who aren't the tallest need to be out behind the three-point line. He wow. said, that's exactly where I went from then yeah. on out. I was like, good man, good man. Hey, by the way, by the way, we I'm sure we missed the conversation, but he, but CJ led me into it. I think Riley Leonard was the biggest get in the portal by any college team. But that's a discussion wow. for another day. Where Did he go to Ohio State? Or where, Notre Dame. Notre Dame. That's right, because we'll, we'll – uh, Will Howard with Ohio State. Look, look, I I mean, Duke was going to win 10 or 11 games if he didn't get hurt. He was that good of a player for me. And he's going to Notre Dame with uh, better players around him. I, th- I think that was a huge get in the offseason. I this don't know what it is. Notre Dame can't get over the hump right now, no matter who their quarterback is. No. Let's see if it keeps going. This is prime offseason talk, but Notre Dame going kind of one-year rentals each year the last two years with Sam Hartman last year, obviously Leonard this year. Is that a a strategy you could see working in the portal? Well, they recruited so badly at quarterback for about four years. I don't think they had any choice. I mean, they had some – I hate to say, I mean, they had bust after bust after – Hey, UT boy, hello, man. Good to see you there. Hope everything's well. Um, Good to have you in the day. Uh, but, yeah, I think they they missed on so many quarterbacks for a three- or four-year run that, that it, it, they just had no choice. But I, I will say this. We talked about this last year, CJ, during the season. At one point, 16 of the top 25-ranked teams in the AP poll all had transfer quarterbacks. 
It's crazy. I, I don't think it's a sustainable model to do. I don't that. either. Um, because you're, it, here's the other issue. Like, your quarterback is expected to be your leader of the team. And how do you do that in one year? You know, I mean, I'm not trying to be, you know, rude about it, but I think that's really, really hard. You'd have to have a, a almost pro-like culture on your team that would allow that to be a regular thing. And I don't know that you can really have a pro-like culture in, in college football. I mean, you have these guys are too young coming in. A lot of the high school guys. I, I just I feel like that's a, that's a difficult transition to, to ask players to make. Hey, CJ, you saw uh, KJ Lacey in person at that seven on seven tournament in Lockhart it, it, down there. Um, is there he, he can make all the throws like Jerry's talking about? You confirm that. And then also, th is there a favorite thing you like about him? Like a specific thing that you say that dude does that as well or better than anybody in the country? I was I was very encouraged by not only the pace in which he was able to get balls out to his receivers, but the arm angles as well. And you might be saying, well, it's seven on seven. Like, you know, he doesn't have a rush. There's not a quarterback. There's not a window in which he's got to really fit it between helmets or, or arms or whatever. But, you know, there are times where he's by the goal line. There's tight angles in which you got to get it around on the on the goal line, get it out, you know, in between you know, defenders and stuff like that. He was making throws in which he was dropping to a three-quarter arm slot, kind of below sidearm, looking like a baseball uh, shortstop turn into. You see, you hear that all the time when you, you talk about guys that, that, that can do that, the Matt Staffords, the Patrick yeah. Mahomes, is those of the world. He was doing that regularly. And I thought in a, it was a very windy environment in Lockhart that day. The wind was blowing straight into a seven-on-seven -seven field in which the, in, in the, the, the end zone in which he was going into – so adjusting to that on the fly, in which he probably made about six or seven warm-up throws going into that wind, he turned around and immediately he was like, you know what, this isn't going to be an issue for me. So that was impressive to me uh, just off a of first rip. And then I really just like the kind of charisma he had about himself. You know, you talk to KJ, he's um, you, we talked about it, very likable guy, a guy that we want to talk to again, obviously. But you see other guys that, one, he's not playing against, or two, that might not know him, but they look at him and say, you know, that guy has fun when he plays football. I like the way that he – has a that the demeanor he has about himself when he's on the football field it kind of you know trickles down to his teammates uh guys he was playing with was actually the first time uh he met all of his his teammates for that seven on seven tournament brought them down to campus obviously he got to shake hands with all of them hang out with them a little bit before getting on the field and by the end of it they were all jumping around taking photos you know having fun it he is a very contagious personality at the quarterback spot all right, guys. Uh, this next question from Kevin Randolph. Jerry, do we have a legit shot at DeCorian Moore from Duncanville? Yeah, ask me again in a few months. That one's going to take a while to play out, but Texas will uh, recruit through the whistle. Uh, there's no doubt about it. He is an elite, elite talent. Uh, everything publicly is locked in with LSU, uh, but uh, the conversations remain with Texas, but that will take a while to play out. Yep. Look at the, the momentum LSU has right now. It's going to be tough to pry that away on the trail, but similarly to Colin Simmons, get him on an official visit late in the season there in that June period, you'll start seeing a little, a little movement in my eyes. Let's see how LSU does this year on the field too. Let's see if they can, they can domino that. Uh, to, to Jerry's point though, I think they're, they're killing it on in recruiting. And I don't see that momentum ebbing at least until the football season. Are they that's, rocking with Nussmeyer? That's what I think. That's what yeah. I've heard. Let's, I'm ready to see. I, it. Dallas area uh, player. His his dad's a football coach. Uh, I think he's an intelligent quarterback. Based on yeah. what I've seen, I'm not sure he has all can make all the throws. Right, but I you know 90 percent there. I, we had we had Nuss at a Deion Sanders Prime 21 camp when Deion was with Under Armour and I was ESPN Under Armour. He's got that moxie about him. The Bobby's point. He's not the most arm gifted guy. He's just got a lot of juice to him. By the way, his younger brother. 2027 freshman quarterback up at Flyer Mound, Marcus, a lefty. Go watch his huddle. Pretty good. The Texas Tech, a couple others have already offered him. He's got Power 5 offers as a freshman. So he's a guy that's going to be coming up in the state of Texas. All right, guys, we got some questions regarding cornerback recruiting. And so let's start with those. Patrick Page says, Dorian Bruce seems very interested in Texas. No one has been talking about that. What, well, what are you all hearing on Bruce? <laughs> I think he had a really good junior day visit on the 20th. Uh, he was locked into Ohio State, but then backed off the commitment date, right? Um, so that has given Texas, everybody else, a chance to really make a push there. 
I, I still think Ohio State, I think Texas are, you know, I think those are your top two. And I think there's going to be a lot of schools in it uh, nationally. Uh, but he had a good visit to Texas and he has backed off. He was supposed to commit January 24th and he backed off that date. So that was good news for all the pursuers because if he had committed January 24th, he was going to Columbus. I've heard some good things about that behind the scenes, by the way. Uh, so I'm not saying that he's going to Texas or anything like that. I don't want to, I don't want to push that narrative, but I do want to say that Texas, look, Texas went to see him three out of four days, basically. They went on a Friday. He saw him on a Saturday and they went back on a Monday. Yeah. He got I mean, the Sark helicopter treatment. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There's, there's a level of, of interest there from Texas. Uh, Devin Sanchez, the other corner. Uh, that Texas really loved early in in the game. He's already committed to Ohio State uh, as well. Uh, there, look, I think that Texas needs two big time cornerbacks in this recruiting class. CJ and I've talked about that, Jerry, while you were out. I, I I'm a big believer that corner right now is maybe that next place where they need an elite elite guy. Yeah, I, I want to comment on Devin Sanchez because obviously I go over to North Shore quite a bit. Of th those guys do a great job over there, Coach Cross defensively, and um, they just do a great job with that program. But if you talk to them off the record, it started since the freshman year. I guess it's on the record right now. Uh, but on Devin Sanchez, no red flags. They love the kid. They said not only is the talent you see, but he's a complete buy-in kid. He works hard. He's got good people around him. They and that hasn't always been the case. They they've been very upfront about some of their guys, uh, even with colleges. They think Devin is uh, does all the right things, uh, puts in the work. Uh, it, it, he welcomes leadership roles and things they ask of him. So uh, they are very high on Devin Sanchez. And when the North Shore staff is very high on somebody, they normally end up hearing their name called on Sunday. High price. When, they're, when they're not, sometimes they're talented enough that they still get their name. <laughs> but, but if they're really high on somebody, like that's that's a good sign for that prospect. Wow. Okay, Ray Potter wants to know what are your thoughts on Texas corner recruiting for twenty five after losing Antoine Sanchez and maybe Brew. Hey, Bobby, CJ, y'all hit on some of those guys in Arizona. They're kind of popping up right now because I think this is expanding nationally as far as some of the guys Texas is evaluating. I think I think that's happening. And then you look at Cortland Guillory yesterday. You know, I, I think that they're 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 looking high and high and all right, long and wide. I I am a little surprised they're not doing a little more in the deep south at corner. I, I will add that because the deep south has a lot of corners, guys. Um the one that they are going after is I think Chuck McDonald at modern day out west. Yeah. That's a name that not many Texas fans are aware of, but it's certainly in the picture. So um, overall, I, I, I look, you got to find guys that are, I, we've talked about this. What, what is Texas looking for in the secondary? Guys that can run and guys that have length. Yeah. That is, that's the two things. And then their willingness to play through contact. Those, those things are what Texas is looking for, period, right now. I think I think uh, we reported on on Texas football that uh, PK was down at uh, uh, Parker High School. Now I don't know if he got out of there without uh, bruises from Auburn and Alabama fans, but uh, that's a tough place to go recruit. They have a lot of talented skill guys, and they have a couple of top DB prospects. Uh, but uh, good luck. That was a, that was big work going in the Parker High in, in Alabama by PK. <laughs> he might he might have taken a few. Uh, yeah, he was in Illinois earlier in the day. I mean, he yeah. went from DFW to Chicago to Birmingham in a single day. That, I mean, you talk about racking up the air miles. Yeah. You're getting them rewards. Todd Lacey says, Jalen Bell, 2025 corner, decommitted from LSU. Is he someone that Texas might be recruiting or no? I haven't heard that name, but we'll look into it. Yeah, he was committed to LSU in October of 2022, decommitted this, uh, this past uh, – I guess this morning, yesterday, last night. So uh, he's been committed in that fold for the the 25 LSU class for quite a while. Doesn't have the top end speed and isn't as lengthy as we've talked about. So that might be a, a, a deterrent from the Texas staff to pursue as heavily as we've seen with other prospects. And, and to that point, Corey Raymond being back at LSU, I mean, I think that they, it, that changes some of the things you're looking at from what you want at corner. And they may have left, let him go is the way I read that uh, based on what I know. But 
Bobby TD Brown asks, is Sark the best head coach recruiter in the country as of now? Seems like he is everywhere. It's great seeing how involved he is in all of these recruitments. I think that is a, 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 a sign in which Texas fans should be kind of applauding Sark for what he's done in the last couple of cycles uh, with, with kind of, you know, I, I wouldn't say a lot of staff turnover, but at times there's been, you know, obviously Brendan Marion coming in, Chris Jackson, you got to go uh, Johnny Nansen as well. Obviously Kenny Baker, it's been some times where he's had to, you know, step in and be that position coach on the trail in a sense, but he's been a tremendous closer as well when it comes to getting guys uh, on campus for their official visits, sitting down with them and basically just displaying why it is that Texas should be the pick for them. I've heard tremendous things in terms of what he's able to bring to a table in a one-on-one -on -one conversation, presenting the University of Texas in a great light. He's been very hands-on, and it's, uh, you know, in terms of national scale, he's certainly in that conversation. I know Nick Saban was as well, maybe not so much towards the end of his career. Uh, Dan Lanning's another one out at Oregon. You sit down to, next to him, and he can he can really uh, pitch you why you should go up to Eugene. So Sarkeesian's done tremendous, though. Yeah, I'll say this, too. To, to the CJ's point, Ryan Wingo is not at Texas without Sark being personally involved in that recruitment for months and months and months. I know NIL's real deal, but in college football, but Sarkeesian being that personally involved is. I'll tell you what else it, it says. Sark is very driven right now. You don't see an ounce of what anybody would call laziness on the recruiting trail out of your head coach at all. And that, as for a Texas fan, that's the best thing I can tell you. I, that's the best thing I can tell you. I, Jerry, so you, you're so right on. Like the the last thing you want uh, as your head coach is someone that's not willing to go the extra mile. The thing that makes potentially Sark the best recruiting head coach right now. I mean, I, I think you would argue maybe Kirby Smart is in that category. I think Mario Cristobal and Dan Lanning are in that category of salesmen that also have are, are trying to push the teams. Um, is that he just doesn't take no for an answer and he sticks with his guys. Like, I, I'm telling you, that's a rare, rare thing to be told no and still go after someone. I mean, <laughs> a lot of people just play the numbers game. I'm going to ask 20 girls to go to dance with me and maybe one will say yes, right? Well, Sark kind of hones in on two or three, you know, and sticks after those two or three. That's the difference in – I think Crystal Ball at Miami is a little like that too, by the way. I think he he comes in late with a lot of late flips. You don't see a lot of late flips for Oregon, um, but I do think you see that with Texas. Yeah, I, I was impressed a, a couple of weeks back. I went to uh, watch Jonah Williams play basketball uh, against Friendswood where I went to school. Um, obviously, Friendswood has a freshman point guard that's really good, by the way. Uh, but we're not going to talk about basketball yet uh, because we need Rodney to win it in TCU Saturday to talk about <laughs> basketball. But um, uh, Dan Lanning was there the whole game watching Jonah Williams and made sure Jonah Williams knew after the game he walked right by his face. That's what really, really good recruiters do. They don't leave at halftime uh, to head to the next stop the next day or go have the late dinner. He stayed the entire game, and I know that makes an impression. Okay, guys, we're going to go back to the corner recruiting for just one second as we got one other question, this one from Ray Potter. And he says, any chance we get modern-day corner Darius Dixon? I think that they're in on him. I don't know that it's him or the Chuck McDonald that has more interest uh, in Texas right now. Yeah, interesting duo out of modern-day. Obviously, Texas has – Pretty solid inroads right now. Darius Dixon is about six foot, but carries a six six wingspan. So you talk about length at the cornerback position. That's what that's what you get with Darius Dixon as well. Chuck McDonald, you're probably more of a nickel guy. A lot of his tape is is in the slot, kind of in that man to man coverage there. So uh, he's a guy that can certainly bring the boom as well. If you watch his tape, he's a guy that can can light some folks up around the line of scrimmage. Uh, so I, I see them as two different spots, but in that same secondary, you talk about talent. <laughs> the two of them is very special. Okay, well, before we move on, Bobby, I'm going to let you tell everybody out there about BKCW and escaping the insurance trap. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, BKCW is a business insurance company operating out of its headquarters in Austin and owned by a UT grad. BKCW uses a five-step process to identify your business's weak spots, design a plan, execute it, and monitor your situation throughout the year so that you can lower your insurance costs and effectively manage your company's risk. 
BKCW has already helped some of the most well-known construction companies, restaurant groups, breweries, nonprofits in Central Texas escape the insurance trap. And it all starts with a free risk assessment. Go to BKCW.com, send an email to info at BKCW, however you want to talk to them. Get started with a free risk assessment or claims audit and escape the insurance trap. Thank you, BKCW, for your support of On Texas Football. Uh, Mike Webb saying, uh, referencing uh, Chip Kelly interviewing in the NFL for the Washington Commanders OC job. We, we kind of hit on that yesterday. I mean, some of these guys, I think, feel like they're in no man's land uh, and you don't really have a chance to compete for it all. And, I, and that's crazy to say at UCLA, but I think that's the case right now um, that you're seeing some of these guys exit to the NFL. Yeah, he, he was uh, it was it was reported yesterday he interviewed twice for the Raiders offensive coordinator, coordinator job. So it looks like he's really trying to get out of college. Yeah, <laughs> which I, makes it I, interesting because Jed Fish would have been the UCLA hire. He just took the Washington job. So where would UCLA go? Hey, Washington's a better job than UCLA. 100 yeah. percent. I got news for you. More more support, more um, more fan support and more institutional support. Washington is a better job than UCLA. Um, hey, some people are asking about Ricky Stewart. I, we need to get to that before we get out uh, about Ricky Stewart decommitting from SMU. CJ, I'm going to let you handle that one, buddy. That's the running back from Tyler Chapel Hill. Yeah, uh, team to watch there is Baylor. Baylor actually hired the SMU running back uh, running back coach. Sorry, uh, his name just ex escaped me. I was trying to look it up real quick. I'm not fast enough, but uh, Baylor – just uh, hired SMU's running back coach who he had previously committed to at SMU. That is something to watch right now. Obviously, teammate Demetrius Brisbane at Chapel Hill just committed to Baylor last night as well. Uh, that's something, obviously, a, a couple ties heading in, into the to Waco right now. Texas obviously made a great impression on the junior day when they offered. He, you know, as we've talked about, got a little emotional, was able to really encapsulate what the offer meant to him in terms of his recruitment and also what he's been able to develop on the field. This is a guy that rushed for 3,000 yards as a junior out at Chapel Hill. Uh, but right now, Baylor is the team to watch and keep a close eye on for uh, Ricky Stewart. And I'll add to that, if he doesn't quickly move on Baylor – in the next week or two, it may get more interesting, right? With Brisbane flipping to Baylor, that's when it gets a little more interesting. Sark was by there last week. How, let me ask you all this. How hard is Texas pushing for him, not just him, but for a lot of recruits they've offered? Like, I get the feeling that Sark isn't – they're not yes. back there saying, we need you now, go, go ahead and commit. They're wanting to play – again, Sark's wanting to play the long game – and I think see these guys as much as possible before he decides we got to have this guy. I, 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 we didn't get a chance to talk about it, but let's go back to the January 20 junior day. I thought that was an evaluation day as much as anything, uh, because we talked about this during the season. What did the win from over Alabama getting to the playoff playoff do for Texas? They get more kids to campus. And when you get more gets to campus, you can do more complete evaluations, your hikes, your weights, your wingspans, your hand sizes, and your sit down talk tos with those guys. I think you're seeing more offers go out right now. The evaluation process, I think, is in the early stages for 25 in a weird way to say, especially nationally. So you're going to see Texas try to bring a lot of those kids in in March for spring practices, get that hand sizes, the wingspan sizes, see what they do, because, you know, you have Under Armour camps coming up. They start, I believe, February 11th in Orlando next weekend. Um, you're, so they're going to start to see some times on guys. Some shuttles, some 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 tens, some forties. They're going to see some video one on ones on those guys, best on best, like an AAU basketball environment. So I think to Bobby's point, the evaluation process is still early in twenty five, with some can't miss guys at the top. Hey, I one thing, one other thing I want to mention on Chip Kelly, guys. Somebody in the chat said, "Well, UCLA can't compete with uh, USC when it comes to NIL." Okay, that's accurate. Yeah. But here's another thing that's accurate. They can't compete with coaches' salaries. Right. I mean, DeAnton Lynn just took the went from UCLA defense coordinator to USC defense coordinator. Yeah, that was a bad sign. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> so it's not. I mean, UCLA is a really. Uh, I don't. I don't know how committed they are to football. I'll just put it that way. Yeah. 
Uh, we got a, a super chat we need to read. Then we'll take a couple of team questions before we get out of here. And super chat from Edmund Lee says, the team is back together. Great knowledge, expertise, comments, head and shoulders above the other programs. What a mixture of broadcasting talents from jerky to manscape. Expect 40K by the spring game. Hook them horns. Let's Blake, is it true you're keeping the manscape read? Are you <laughs> hey. playing keep away with that? Yeah, I told you I'd let you read it one one time a week, and I'll read it once a week. <laughs> you, get, you got something else coming. You got oh yeah, <laughs> so you you can share it. All right, guys. Well, we we've talked about recruiting in depth. Let's take a few team questions, and um, we'll start with this one right here from King Me. Any update on how Owens and Wingo are looking in winter workouts? Have y'all heard anything? I have not heard much about Owens. I have heard very positive reviews on Ryan Wingo. Very positive. Yeah. <laughs> you and I, CJ and I, we have two different sources on this. Uh, Wingo was one of the guys that got mentioned to me. Zena was a guy that got mentioned to me, Umio Zulu. Um, Xavier Filsamy was actually the first word, first name out of my source's mouth, uh, the safety out of McKinney. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think they're, they're – excited about the 2024 recruiting class. I think that's safe to say. I don't know if uh, CJ got a chance to talk to Trey at the uh, Adidas All-America game, but um, but my, my son happened to have a couple of classes with Trey uh, at Cy Fair. They're, they got to be kind of buddies. Trey was up to 235 pounds yep. by the, when he left Cy Fair. I mean, so he, he had put on a lot of good weight uh, late in his high school, let's say career, high school life, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but he put on a lot of really good weight headed into Texas. I mean, he's just he's as big as uh, he's as big as Malik Murphy, guys. Yeah, in some ways. I mean, y'all realize that? I mean, y'all yeah. remember how big Malik Murphy looked? Yep. I mean, he, he told me down in San Antonio he was, he was standing, and Arch Manning is a big quarterback. Uh, somebody's asking about Colin Simmons' ankle. I I can kind of talk about that a little bit because I was down at the Under Armour game. Um, it was a high ankle sprain. Um, because he went down there and he was thought about giving it a go at the Under Armour game. But the guys that run Under Armour, I worked with for years, they're really smart about that. They, they got him to the trainer there uh, associated with the game. And the guy was like, no, high ankle sprain, hold him out. He does not need to play in this game. Legitimate high ankle sprain. The word I got was that uh, he would be fine. And nothing structural, nothing serious, that he just needed a little time. Yeah, Simmons said in Orlando that he had suffered that injury about midway through his season and played through it, only kind of adding to the player he is and competitor, but also that ankle didn't get any better as the season progressed. And by the way, prospects, if you have an injury, you got to blast it on social media so you didn't get dropped 20 spots in ranking. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Oh, Jerry with the shot there. <laughs> Jim Bailey 3 says, Jerry, is the Martin I Black's catch radius bigger than JT Sanders was? Yeah, he's got longer arms. I don't I don't remember a number on that, but I, I think an I Black has long arms for a 6'3 frame. But I, I, I'll try to see if I can find the exact number on it. But, yeah, I, I, it'll be interesting to see what JT measures at in, in NFL combine. I'm guessing he's a neutral or plus one guy, and I Black's definitely more of a plus four, plus five guy. And then Troy wants to know, Sark often used Murphy and Sweat as their fullback and goal line sets. Who do you guys see filling that role this year? We were talking about that the other day, weren't we, Bobby? Yeah. Um, I think Malik Agbo is a guy, if he's not on the end line, you can certainly see him as an up back. I think that's the number one guy you can look to. It's kind of fill that void. Right now, who do they trust? Yeah, the thing with Agbo, too, like the thing with uh, – like Agbo is a – lateral quick mover, not a forward quick mover. So I don't see him going into the backfield. I don't know that they have anybody right now. That I, I I'll, put, I'll put my hand up on this one. Go. Uh, Dre Bledsoe. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if, 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 if he can get there, yeah. If, if he can get there, yes. If he can be reliable, yeah. right? I mean, that's that's been one of the issues right now. He needs to be reliable with what his assignments are. And he needs to gain weight. Yeah. Because we all, I mean, I, you want to talk about hidden gems on the Texas roster? Circle that guy's name. Yeah. Because he could, if the light bulb turns on there, the, you know. You know, you know how this goes when new coaches get in town too, right? Uh, Kenny Baker's going to get on the field in the spring with him and say, holy, look at this guy. What a freak athlete. All right. Now, now it's your job to get it out of him. Yep. He is hellacious athlete. Yep. 
All right. Uh, Edmund Lee says, who is expected to be the best edge this season? Ooh. Okay. Man, there's three, right? You got to have... You, you have the the you have the three upperclassmen in Trey Moore, the newcomer, Baron Sorrell, and Ethan Burke. Justice Finkley sitting fourth right now, probably. But then you have the newcomers in Colin Simmons and Zena. Um, I'm gonna I tell you what I'm gonna go with Ethan Burke and Baron. Uh, I, I'm torn between Ethan Burke and Baron Sorrell. I don't know about Trey Moore. I just I want to see how he. How it how playing against better competition affects him as a run as, as a pass rush. That's my biggest. I mean, I haven't because he's not real long armed, guys. Right. Not like he's a super freak athlete or something. We're not talking Dallas Turner, 81 inch wingspan at six. No, points. no. And so I, I'm interested to see how that all converts. Yeah. Anybody all else work as well? Who's the best edge? Who do y'all think is the best edge? Jerry and CJ? Blake? I, I have Burke. I, I like Burke. His size is uh, as well moving to the SEC because of his length and year yeah. three. I, I look back at last year, the biggest games, biggest moments. Alabama had a sack and a half. Kansas State at home had a strip sack on the goal line. He stood up and he he performed well in those moments. It's getting more consistency out of him. And I think going into year three, you'll see more of that. Hey, can you bring up Isaiah Stewart's question? I think it's a great question for all yep. of us. You ask me, but it's a great question. Yep. Uh, what was your favorite moment from this past season? We actually talked about this. I think that's why he's asking because yeah. we've all answered, and now he's wanting yours. And which moment was most impactful? Yeah, so I think it's the same um, for me it, because I started recruiting and then moved the season. It was Sark walking out of Tuscaloosa uh, with a hook him <laughs> after that game, walking off the field. That That was it. I'm gonna I'm gonna go a little bit different. Um, I think that winning in Tuscaloosa, you know, you could have ch chalked that up to oh, it was a little bit of you know him just out coaching. It, it could be a, a once once off thing, right? Like you didn't know if they were gonna kind of come out and be dominant the rest of the year, and then they went and lost to OU, a team they should have beat, right? I think the one that told me okay, this team has arrived is Adonai Mitchell's catch. When that happened, you're like, all right, we're here. A guy made a big play, big time play at a big time play of the, the, the season. So that, that would be mine. I'll tell you from a, maybe it's crazy to say the most memorable play for me may have been uh, Jonathan Brooks one play in the big 12 championship. That was cool. Yeah. Because that is a coach that gets it. And a team that gets it. That's Arch Manning who gets it as well. Turning around, tossing him the ball right away to acknowledge it. You know, as a as a freshman, you don't see that too often. So that's really cool. I, I loved it all around. Okay, guys, this is going to be the last question for today, and it's actually from one of David Williams' comments today. He says the five most important true freshmen for Texas are the following: January, Phil Sami, Wingo, Simmons, and then the punter Michael Kern. My question to y'all is, who are the five most important true freshmen for Texas this season? I haven't had a punter comment in a long time. I, you know what makes Michael Kern so interesting to me? If Texas does not take a punter in the portal after the spring, that tells you how high Jeff Banks is on Michael Kern as a freshman punter in the SEC in major college football. That would be a sign of Texas being extremely high on a freshman that's not talked about at all, by the way. Um you know, I, I Phil, Phil Sami is a big one. Um, Colin Simmons is a big one because moving to the SEC, if you're not going to be as dominant inside, then you have to make up for it on the outside next year. I think that's a big thing for me. I think you can have different strengths defensively um, and still be a similar defensive team in terms of production. Uh, but I think edge pass rush is so huge. So you throw Colin Simmons in. You throw Trey Moore in, obviously, out of the portal. But I think those two guys are huge for this team next year. I got think you got to add a, a corner in there. Because right now, the, your your top four corners are Brooks uh, Brooks and uh, Muhammad, Gavin Holmes, and Warren Roberson. Okay? They may be moving Warren Roberson around a little bit this spring. One of the young corners, whether it's Wardell Mack or Kobe Black, may need to be in there. I think January, obviously, from a numbers perspective, until or unless we see another 
defensive tackle come through in the portal is an obvious pick. Uh, Phil Samy, just based on what I've heard of late, I would agree with. And Ring, Wingo, uh, if any of the freshman wide receivers have a chance to break through, in my opinion, it's him. I think it's certainly encouraging. We saw it a little bit last year as well. There weren't a lot of freshmen that were asked to start and played large roles. We're walking into the spring ball right now thinking, who of this freshman class, granted very talented class, is going to carve out a, a large role? Or who's going to start? Right now, I don't know if you're going to see any freshmen starting uh, going into spring football, carrying into the fall. I know Anthony Hill won the job last year, but you saw it as well. There's a lot of experience at a lot of key positions as well. That's the sign of a good college football team, experience and guys that have been through it. And so I'm very encouraged by the sense that you can have these guys sit back, relax, and develop behind the scenes while getting college experience, not necessarily being thrown into the fire right away. All right, y'all. Well, Bobby, before we get out of here, why don't you tell folks what they can expect not only later today, but through the weekend on on Texas football. Yeah, absolutely. We have a one o'clock live stream. Uh, Rod Baber is going to join Jerry, myself, uh, CJ. Uh, we'll talk a little Texas football this afternoon. Uh, and then also uh, football theory uh, is moving to Saturday for this week only. Uh, Bob Shipley and Rod Babers will be back talking it. Uh, we've got a number of other things going on as well. Uh, join us on ontexasfootball.com. Uh, make sure you check out the community thread, not just uh, the articles that we have on there. Although I will say uh, the recruiting update this morning, guys, was just ab absolutely outstanding uh, from the three of you guys. It was a, a pleasure to read this morning when I woke up. Uh, so anyways, long story short, join us on ontexasfootball.com. Read the articles. Come visit us on the community portion of it. Join in. Uh, we appreciate you guys. And thanks for uh, thanks for hanging out uh, with us this morning. Yep. Thank you all for tuning in. Thank you for all the great questions. The super chat says, Bobby said, head on over to ontexasfootball.com. And if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to the On Texas Football YouTube channel. We would appreciate that as well. So got to also thank BKCW for helping us escape the insurance trap. So be sure to check them out. And for Bobby, Jerry, and CJ, I'm Blake Monroe, and we'll see you on Monday morning.